let me the begin so the first thing i'll do today is to fix the normalization because so far you have been saying that we will try to eventually fix the normalization by comparing with the free theory so the partial function that we have arrived at let me now go to the free theory which means that both the gauge fields and the ghost become free in the g goes to zero limit so in this case we have integral this is the general structure of the action this is the gauge action this is the ghost action and i am working in the Feynman gauge settings i equal to 1 okay that's why the kinetic terms are the simple box now this i can write in the momentum space so i can rewrite this as integrals over the momentum space variables k e square is omega n square plus k e square is this okay i have just rewritten this in the momentum space this of course can be evaluated easily by the standard tricks that we have been following so this is basically given by product over n product over k of k square plus omega n square first of all from here we will get a factor for every a we will get a factor of minus 2 because 
for a single scalar, for example, it's this a square to the power minus half, right? When you do an integral, it's the determinant to the power minus half. Okay. There are four of them, right? A0, A1, A2, A3, right? Or uh, D of them. So we'll get, so let, uh, let's set D equal to 3. So we'll get k, k square plus omega square to the power minus 2. Is this clear? And from here, we get a factor of k square plus omega n square. Because this is the Grassmann integral. So now we get a thing in the numerator. And this whole thing will be raised to the power ng, where ng is the dimension of the group. ng is the number of generators. Okay. Basically, this comes because the product over a here. For every a, we get that factor. Okay. There are ng of these a's, okay. so it will be raised to the power ng. Is this clear? Okay. So from this, you can calculate the free energy per unit volume. So f over v is minus t over v log z. So this basically gives you minus t times integral d dk over 2 pi to the d. Okay, this part of the analysis is similar to what we did for say the uh, bosons are formulas. Okay, the standard analysis and then you get times ng log of k square plus omega n square inverse. Or you can write this as p times integral sum over n. I forgot sum over n. Let me write ng outside. And now I add to this some function of t to take care of the normalization ambiguity. Okay, because throughout I have been ignoring the overall normalization, but I have been emphasizing that is a function of t, but that does not depend on any of the parameters of the theory. Okay, so now I add back that arbitrary function to take care of the overall normalization. Is this point clear? Okay. So let me repeat again. All I have done here is that I have gone to the free limit. Okay. In the free limit, the gauge kinetic term is simple. The Rose kinetic term is simple. Okay. Then I have just simply evaluated the integral over the gauge fields and the ghosts. Okay. In the okay, first I have wrote it in the momentum space, okay. and then I just integrated out. This is a Gaussian integral, so I just integrated out the gauge fields and the ghosts. In that process, producing determinant. Okay, in this case, determinant just means that k is square to an appropriate part, right? Because it's a diagonal matrix. Okay, that's the reason that we chose this gauge. Okay. So the determinant is to evaluate k square is k square plus omega n square. The gauge fields give this fun factor. Okay. Each gauge field component gives you minus half. This to the power minus half, but there are four components. Okay. Those four components gives to the minus two. These are the contribution for the ghosts. Okay, one pair of ghosts gives you k square. Okay, that's what I've written here. And then eventually you have to raise this whole thing to power ng because there are ng number of gauge fields and ng number of ghosts. Right? This a runs over a to n. Okay, and that's the final answer that I have written by taking the long.
this is given by volume. Pardon? This is given by the volume. No, it's not divided by the volume because the point is that here there is a product over k, right? When you take the log, this becomes sum over k, right? Sum over k when you convert to integral, right? It becomes v times integral d dk over 2 pi to the d. Right? That v basically cancels this 1 for v which is coming here. Right? So this is not divided by the volume, right? That v was accompanying this that has got to cancel. <laughs> The ghost field basically cancels uh, two of the field contribution of the gauge fields. Two yes, that's right. Just by this fact. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, so we are going to make it more explicit now by comparing with the scalar field results. Okay. So let me remind you that if you have a massless scalar or massless scalar, one massless scalar. We have f over v was given by t sum over n integral d d k by to d norm d by two. Okay, this we had derived. If you don't remember the derivation, I mean it's not very hard to see where it comes from, right? Because for a free massless scalar, you have exponential of phi, then box phi, right? That box gives k square plus omega n square. Okay, you have to integrate over phi, so you get k square plus omega n square to the power minus half. Okay, and that when you now take minus t over v log z, you get back this term. But again, here we have a correction, okay, which is to take care of the normalization. And for free massless scalar, you had to fix this normalization okay, by comparing with the corresponding harmonic oscillator result. Okay. And we had shown that once you have appropriately fixed this Fs okay, for a free massless scalar, the result that we get is given by. Minus pi square t to the 4 over 90. Okay, this is the result that we have found for free massless scalar after summing over these integers and doing the integral. Now, if you compare this expression with this, this looks like the result for 2 ng massless scalars, right? Because there is a t by 2 here, there is ng times t here. Okay. So the gauge theory result, gauge theory result, we took 2 ng times the massless scalar. But there is a qualification, we have to choose, we have to choose that this f of t that we had here should be equal to 2ng times fs of t. Okay, because this result that I have quoted is after you have added these corrections.
Is this okay? And this is the choice we will make. Okay, and we will see that this is the right choice. So suppose you have made this choice. Then from this result, the fact that this is equal to this implies that the that f over t for gauge theory is given by 2 ng, 2 ng times minus pi square t to the 4 or 9. And this, in fact, is the correct answer. One or to see the correct that this is the correct answer is suppose you take okay this is like ng abelian gauge fields right in the uh, g goes to zero limit right you don't see the effect of the structure functions right so it's as good as ng abelian gauge fields so let's suppose you have one abelian gauge field, right what is the expected answer for the free energy for one abelian gauge field yeah just photon gas right. That result, if you remember, is minus pi square t to the 4 over 45. Okay. It's not hard to see why, because one photon is equivalent to two scalars, basically. It has two independent polarizations, right? Otherwise, it's like there's like two massless scalars, right, as far as the partition function is concerned. And that's why it's twice that of a scalar. So ng photons will give you ng times an answer. Right. ng times minus pi square t to the 4 over 90, the over 45, and that's what we are finding. So this basically shows that this is the correct choice. Okay, that after you have gotten this, for a free theory, well, this choice of course doesn't care about whether it's free or interacting, right? Because this is not independent of the coupling constraints. Okay. So the correct choice that you have to make for f of t okay, is that it should be 2 ng times the choice for a scalar. Well, you can always go to an appropriate limit where the answer is known. Right? Just like for scalars, you went to an appropriate limit where the, it was a collection of harmonic oscillators and you compared. Right? So, because see, the, the result, what you are trying to compute is clear and that's well defined. Trace of e to the minus beta h. Right? We are formula, giving it a, a path integral formulation. Right? But you can also directly try to, if you know the spectrum, we can directly calculate trace of e to the minus beta h. Right? And that's the way we calculate the partition function of a gas of, of a uh, uh, gas of photons in statistical mechanics. Right? We don't use path integral, you just calculate directly trace of e to the minus beta h. Okay? So there is a definite answer right, which you can calculate in appropriate limit, and that's what you can compare it to fix the overall normalization. Is this okay? Okay, so we'll now go into the interacting theory okay? and let me again specify the strategy. So what we are going to calculate in the interacting theory is the ratio of the interacting partition function to the free partition function. Because a free partition function you already know, right? It's ng times that of a photon. In the ratio of the interacting to free partition function, there is no ambiguity because this f of t will just go away. Okay. That is given g directly by the sum of Feynman diagrams. Okay. So you can calculate the ratio of interacting to free partition function just by summing over Feynman diagrams. Right? And that's what you are going to do. Other questions? Z 
is given by sum of bubble diagrams. Now, if we recall, we had argued that log of 0 over z free well, this is 1 plus sum over of it. It always starts with 1. Okay, because for g equal to 0, it's just 1. Log of 0 over z free. We have derived a Feynman diagram rule for this. Do you remember what that rule is? Sum over connected bubble diagrams. Right? So this is sum over connected bubble diagrams. Now, so is that the earlier case is exponential to the first sum of bubble diagrams or yeah. pardon? Yes, this means this is exponential to sum of bubble diagrams, exactly. Okay? So that's the way in fact we proved it. So the point is for the expand the exponential, the first term is of course always one. Right. That's this one. Okay. Right? Then there'll be a bubble and then yeah. two bubbles and yeah. so on. <laughs> right? And that's yeah. and basically you have to show the combinatorial factor is correct so that it gets just sum of bubble diagrams. Right? At the diagrammatic level, it's clear that when you take sum over connected bubble and exponentiate, right, you will get sum over all possible bubbles. Okay? The non-trivial part is to show that the commutative factors are exactly right. <coughs> okay, now in this sum over bubble diagrams, every bubble diagram has one common factor, and that comes from the energy momentum conserving delta function. So, let me remind you that typically in d plus 1 dimension in the and 0 temperature theory, right, you will have got a 2 pi to the power d plus 1 delta d plus 1 of 0. Right, just overall energy momentum conserving delta function. This is what you get in a Green's function. You get delta d plus 1 of p1 plus p2 plus p3 plus p4, etc. Right? Here, of course, there are the external momentum, so it's just 0. But then we had given an interpretation of what this is. Yeah, this is volume into time. Yeah, so this is a volume of space time, right? We said this delta of zero. Delta of zero for the zero for the first the zero momentum. Okay, nothing but the volume of space time. So this we can replace by theta times d. Where v is the volume of space and beta is the tau direction. Okay, the volume in the target direction. So this we can replace by beta times v. So when you try to calculate f over v, which is minus p over v log 0 over z v. So let me write it as f minus f free over v. Okay, that's, that's what this is. Okay. Then 1 over v cancels this v. And the t cancels the beta. Okay, so this is given by this is given by minus sum of connected bubbles but without delta function. Okay, that's all we have to do. So this, in fact, has a nicer expression. Okay, the free energy per unit volume. Okay. Basically, you just forget about the overall momentum conserving delta function, okay, which will always would have given a factor like this, but that can sense when you calculate this object. Okay, this is again we have discussed it earlier, right, in the context of scalar field theory. So it's the same rules. So now things are easy, right? We have to derive the Feynman rules or just some over connected Feynman. 
power diagrams. So I'll not write down the Feynman rules in detail. Okay, I'll just give the vortices that appear. Okay, you can easily read out from the action. The vortices, what kind of vortex could you have? So, in pure gauge theory, what kind of vortices do you expect? Cubic quartic size. Yeah, so cubic and quartic. But pure gauge theory doesn't mean just gauge fields, right? Pure gauge fields also has hosts, right? So there will be coupling to hosts also. So you remember what kind of coupling is there between hosts and gauge fields? For this particular choice of gauge, del mu a mu, right? That you have cho chosen. Yes. Right? C bar a mu del mu c. Right? Yeah, mm. that kind. So C bar basically that a vortex which involves one host, one anti-host, and one gauge, one gauge right? So it's something like this. Okay. So this particular gauge theory and the rotation that you had used. Was that this is C, this is C bar, and this is H, right? Now, suppose you also have four ones, okay, in some no, no, no. fundamental representations. Then there will also be couplings like this. Okay, each of these you can write down the corresponding expression and you can calculate the bubble diagrams, okay, draw all possible diagrams to a given order, calculate them using these vortices. Okay. That's all that is there to in uh, calculating the partial function. The only thing you have to be careful about is that the sum of the <laughs> factors of i, etc. are not quite the same as in the uh, uh, Lorentzian calculation, okay? because it is an Euclidean calculation that you are doing. So for example, the propagators do not have the i factor, right? and the vortices also do not have i factor. Right? You just take it to the minus ac and expand it out, and that is that's what determines the sign of the vortices. Okay? But otherwise, it is just straightforward. Now, let me come to the issue of infrared divergences. So, if you consider, suppose Loop like this. So I'm just drawing one class of diagram. There are many other classes of diagram that you can draw. So this will be given by a term like T sum over n. and something like delta to the power n over k square to the power n. Then okay. so delta is basically this and 1 over k square comes from here, these propagators. There are equal number of k square and delta. 
Okay. As we had in fact worked out a commutatory factor for this. You remember what a commutatory factor for this? Okay, after some counting, we had found it is 1 over n. Okay, if you go back to the notes for the scalar field theory, right, it is the same commutatory factor, right? Because it is the same diagram okay, with extra extra indices thrown in. And the point that we had emphasized there was that this, the n equal to 0 part of this, right, if we put the n equal to 0 mode, okay, then k is square. So, k is square to begin with was just k square, k square plus omega n square. Okay. For n equal to 0, omega n is 0, right, so you have k square. And you get a high power of k square for large enough n. Okay. And this integral now becomes infinite divergent. Okay, this becomes divergent from the k equal to 0 region, okay, so it is ill defined. Okay. And the remedy was that we have to resum this. Okay. So, you resum this by, so you have to add to this another term which is the phi term, sum over n integral d d k And after resumming, basically we get okay, in fact, I think that it's there is also a minus sign. Right, or maybe I write put a minus sign here. Okay, overall normalization I am not worried about. So it's, it basically gives you something like this. Okay, so basically what happens is you take this sum, this, and add to this a free contribution. Okay, and the sum of this you can rewrite as an expansion of log of k square minus delta. Okay, and once you have done that, then we are safe because now this does not have an infinite diagram. Okay, this delta is some constant that you calculate from this. Okay, this does not have any prior divergence. Okay. But you also showed that the price you pay okay, is not in the form of infrared divergence. Infrared divergence is go away. But the expansion in powers of lambda gets messed up. Okay, there are now terms of, in the case of high 4 theory, there are terms of order lambda to 3 half. So basically the same thing will happen here. Okay. So the idea is that whenever you have situation like this, okay, like for example here, gauge fields are massless, okay, so there will be insertions of this kind, okay, producing terms like this, you have to resum okay, to write it this way. Okay. In this resum from there will be no divergence, okay. effectively the gauge field gets a mass. Right, or the, in the case of scalar field, the scalar field had gotten a mass. Okay. K square minus delta. Okay. So, infrared divergence goes away. Okay. But now, when you actually put in the value of delta and carry out this integral, okay. what we had found okay. was that we effectively get a correction of order lambda to the 3 half. In this case, that will become a correction of order GQ. Okay. Because for 5 4 theory, the expansion is in parts of lambda. For gauge theory, the expansion is in parts of g square. Okay. But you will not get only even part of g only parts of g square, you will also get a order g cube contribution. Okay. That analysis is exactly the same as that of the phi four theory. Is this point clear? Okay. Basically, this g cube term comes because here now this de delta is like g square t square. Okay. So, when you now carry out an integral by using this dimensional regularization trick, right, the renormalized mass has a g square t square, you get g square t square sub to some power. Okay. And that power, okay, if it is 3 half, you basically get a G, order g cube contribution. Right. That is the way the g cube comes in. Okay. That you cannot expand it, expand in powers of g square from the beginning. Right. That is the point. That you have to resum carry out the momentum integral okay, using 
this order g square term as a regulator, as an infrared regulator, right? Because now the infrared divergence is being controlled by this mass term, right? Which is small for small g, right? It's or, or a g square, g square. Okay, and that's what gave rise to this unusual power of lambda, and in this case, it will give rise to unusual power of g. Questions? So, what do you need this uh, fractional form due to the finance also inside you? No. If, if this was a formula, right, for formulas, the n runs over half integer power. Right? So, there there is no problem. There is no infrared divergence. Because if n runs over half integer power, right, this omega never vanishes. Then there is no infrared divergence, you don't have to resum. Right? Then the expansion in powers of g square is perfectly fine. For cubic vertex, then they will be this 3 up. Yeah. Cubic vertex, yes? And then this one. Yes. So the point is imagine that you have a formula loop like this. Okay? And you make a lot of corrections like this. Massless formula loop. Then you will get exactly a problem like this. Okay, if you call this delta, you will get a problem like this. Okay. But now, if k, this k can never go to zero, right? Because k square is now k square plus omega n square, and omega n there is no n equal to zero contribution, right? It is either half or minus half or three half minus three half. So because it never vanishes, right? There is no divergence here. So there is no need for you to resum. Right? You can keep it as it is, and then it, in that form it's manifest that the expansion is in powers of g square. I need to confirm uh, in fact that with this diagram also we have to add the diagrams of the host loop or it yes, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. You are right. Hosts, of course, have n equal to zero, right? Host loop. This yes. So in principle, you have to also consider this renormalized host mass. Okay. But it turns out that the hosts don't get renormalized. Host mass doesn't get renormalized. Okay. So in in I mean, if you just think of it as in terms of power counting, you have to add a host too because hosts, even though they are the Grassmann value, right, they are modes are integer. Right? Because they have satisfied periodic boundary. Okay? So you have to add those loops. Okay? But you don't have to resum because of the fact that these things are zero. Host masses don't get normalized. Right? So the analog of delta is zero for the hosts. Okay? So what I'm going, going to do in the rest of the lecture okay, is to work out explicitly an example of this mass renormalization. Okay, and I'll do the mass renormalization for the gauge fields. So goal is to calculate One loop mastery normalization for gauge fields Now the full calculation is a bit complicated because this will involve the gauge field loops. Okay. It will involve, in fact, several terms. One is like this, then one is like this, one is like this, the post loop. But I'll consider 
a simpler diagram and that's a formula. It's still a gauge field master normalization, but due to formula. Okay. So the point is that the, the sum of these three is gauge invariant by itself, okay. and this is gauge invariant by itself. Okay. The formula loops don't talk to this. Right. So the whatever you get here will be gauge invariant answer, okay. and we will see what it is. Okay, and then I'll state the result for this calculation, but I'll not um, discuss this explicitly. Is this clear? Okay, so let, let's start then calculating this. So the first thing you have to do is to determine this vortex, right? Because there is a three-point vortex of gauge fields and polynomials. So let's look at the action to determine the vortex. So S Euclidean action had this structure that it was gamma tilde mu d mu plus m between psi bar and psi and d mu was del mu minus i g a mu a. This is the, yeah, so the action will be integral of this. You can feel what is this integral. <laughs> <laughs> like that term. Okay, so now the vortex, so the vortex comes by expanding this to minus AC. carries label mu and a. This is psi, this is psi bar. So this I will say the carries index alpha and s and this carries index beta and p. So these alpha and beta at the spinner indices and S and T are gauge indices. So let's write this down. Okay, what is the coupling? There is a minus sign here. Okay, so there will be a minus sign. Okay, so when you expand it out, you get I G a mu a b a s t gamma mu gamma tilde mu alpha beta and psi bar alpha s psi beta p. Is this clear? Gamma tilde mu alpha beta, psi bar alpha psi beta, right? And this T A comes in psi bar S, T A S T psi. T. So this from this we can read out what this vortex is, right? So this vortex then is I G A mu A T A S T gamma tilde mu alpha beta. Oh, no, I okay. So based on this, let's now calculate this two point function. Okay, this two point function. So, let me 
cycle the momentum. So, P u will be incoming momentum. P goes out. This will level by k going this way. And in this direction is k minus k. So, what is the expression for this? So, let me write this. So, first you get 1 over p square whole square. These are coming from the two external gauge propagators. Then we get a trace, okay, there is a formula loop. This okay, formula propagator I had written down once. So, the formula propagator, formula propagator is I think I gamma tilde mu k mu plus m inverse where k is the momentum along the arrow. Okay, basically the momentum that is carried by psi. Okay, because the arrow flows towards psi. So this will be trace of let's start from this i gamma tilde mu k mu plus m inverse okay this I should write as gamma tilde rho k rho because mu and mu are there outside. Then this vortex is i g all this okay, right so let's write i g I'll write separately let's just put the gamma matrix first so gamma tilde mu then we have this one i gamma tilde rho then k rho sorry gamma tilde sigma k sigma minus p sigma the same inverse gamma tilde nu then I have uh, i g whole square okay, from these two vertices. Then I have a trace over T A T B. Okay, these are the gauge indices. Okay, the T A comes from here and T B comes from there. So these two traces can be decoupled. Right? This is the trace over the Hirak index, this is the trace over the gauge index. Okay. Now the common factor. That everything else is in place. That have to, we have to now write the combinatory factor. So it's first of all second order, same vertex coming twice. Okay, so that gives you factor of half to begin with. Okay. Okay. For the gauge fields, how many ways can the gauge fields contract? The two vertices, okay, two external gauge fields. So start from the mu, the first gauge field, right? This can contract in how many ways? Two ways, because there are two gauge fields coming from two vertices, right? It can connect to any of those <coughs> vertices, so it can connect in two ways. Given this, what about the second gauge field? There is only one way, right? So there is nothing. <coughs> Now we have a psi bar psi here and psi bar psi here. How many ways can they contract? There is no choice. There is no choice. Right? Psi bar has to go with psi and psi has to go with psi bar. Okay? So there is no choice there also. But you have to be careful about the signs a little bit. So you have two vertex. One is a psi bar psi. The other one is a psi bar psi. Right? So the contraction is like this.
So is there a sign? Yes? There is a sign. Why, why is there a sign? Yeah. So this is psi psi bar, this is in the correct form, but this is psi bar psi, right? So we have to switch, so that gives a minus sign. So there is an extra minus sign. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so this is the result of calculating this diagram. <laughs> yes? Yeah, means yet the number of crossings will be the sign, right? Earlier, what we did. Yeah, really number of crossings will be the sign, but I had also said, which was a footnote, maybe <laughs> you have forgotten, <laughs> that after you have gotten the number of crossings, right, then you have to also check how many of them are in the form of psi bar psi. For each of those, you have to also put a minus sign. Right? So it is true, there is no crossing, right? So there is no sign from there. Okay? But the fact that there is one psi bar psi, right, means that there is a minus sign coming from there. Is this okay? Any other factor from here? Momentum integration, yes. So the momentum integration, so that gives you T sum over n, an integral d d k over 2 pi to the d. Okay. I should have said that this T that I have written here okay, includes P0, which is uh, this 2 pi n by beta, right? That, uh, and that has that structure and the P vector. Similarly, this k stands for k0, which is the uh, has a discrete piece. And then k vector, which has to be integrated over. Okay, and the integral is over, the sum is over the zero component of k. Okay, zero component of p is fixed. Now you want to use this to calculate renormalized mass of the gauge field. Now at tree level the gauge field has zero mass. So if you are only interested in calculating the renormalized mass, it is enough to evaluate this when the external moment are zero. Is this clear? Because the more dependence on the external momenta is this diagram of course does depend on external momenta. But that will go into computing the wave function normalization, right? Because the way we do it is that you expand this out in a power series in momentum. Okay? The p equal to zero term is responsible for mass renormalization, and the order p square term goes into the, wave, the uh, determining the wave function normalization. Okay? Right now we are not worried about wave function normalization. We are only trying to calculate the mass renormalization. So you can evaluate this at p equal to zero. Okay, so evaluate at p equal to zero, which will make our life somewhat simpler. Evaluate at p equal to zero. But before actually evaluating this, okay, let's try to fix how this result that we have written here okay, is actually related to the normalized mass. Okay, how do get this to the in terms of renormalized mass. And one way to fix this is to assume that suppose we add a mass term to the action, mass term for the gauge phase, okay, by hand. That mass term, and think, treat this as a perturbative term. Okay. So that mass term will induce a two-point function. Right? When you expand it out, that mass term will induce a two-point function. You equate that two point function to what you calculate here, and that's what gives a renormalized mass, right? Because what we are saying is that effectively this diagram okay, is behaving as if there is an explicit two point function for the gauge field that you have added to that. Is this clear? Okay. So if AC gets shifted by AC plus a mass. <laughs> for the gauge field, 
Now, what will be the answers for the mass term for the gauge? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Give me all the factors and all. M square. That will come, right? M square, MU, MU. Is that any half? Uh -huh. Half, right? Okay. But this is unfortunately not enough. Okay. And the reason that this is not enough is because at higher temperature, when you are doing this calculation, okay. we don't have Lorentz invariance, right? So the renewable mass can depend on which mu we are using. Okay? There is no reason why it should not depend on mu. Okay? This assumes that all the mu components get the same mass, okay? which would be true if the theory had had Lorentz invariance, right? But once you have put a finite temperature, you are treating time, the Euclidean time, at an, on a different footing compared to the space coordinates. So what you should really use is something like this. Okay, let's suppose that it depends on mu and mu. Pardon? Yes, mu mu. Thank you. But again, there is an integral. Is this clear? Okay, now the point is, if it so happens that it doesn't depend on mu, it will come out of the calculation, right? But when you try to calculate this, okay, we have to make an answer that it could depend on mu. Okay, so might as well write as m square mu. Now notice that you have not, in general, you could have also said that it depends on a and b. Right? Why not write an m square mu nu a b and write mu a a nu b? Why haven't we done that? Why not write trace of this thing? Right? Because yes. Gauge gauge symmetry. Symmetry. Gauge symmetry is yeah, gauge symmetry is unbroken, right? The global gauge symmetry is unbroken. The gauge, gauge, okay, local gauge symmetry, of course, you have fixed, right? But if you look at this action that we had, AC, okay, if you take a global gauge rotation, that still leaves action invariant, right? So that should be a symmetric. But master is gauge. That's local gauge symmetry. Global. The global, this, this term that you have written is invariant on global gauge symmetry. Right? That is what is unbroken. Local gauge symmetry, of course, we have uh, broken by gauge fixing. Mm -hmm. Is this okay? So let's take this ansatz okay, and calculate what you would get for the two-point function. Okay? So this will give a two-point function which is like this. Okay, again, new. And the result that you produce is again there's a one over p square whole square. That's as the external propagators, which was they are here also, one over p square whole square. Okay, that of course will just cancel from both sides. A B say. So what else would you expect from here? This vortex will give you what? M square mu nu. Then delta IB. Anything else? This is order. This is a first order vortex. Okay. But of course, this is there's a half here. Yeah. What happened to that half? Yes? It will be? Okay, let's write the half anyway. Okay. There is also a minus sign. Yeah. Which it will be minus AC that's when it's finding, right? Not 
plus AC. So the minus sign. Okay. And now let's work out the combinatorial factor. Combinatorial factor will be 2. Because the first gauge field can couple to any one of these two. Mm. Right? And then the second gauge field has plus, so plus 2. So now let's compare this with this. To do that comparison, I have to remember that this is half delta AB. That's how we have normalized it, right? Half delta AB. <coughs> so 1 over P square whole square just cancels from both sides. Okay? Then this half and 2 gives you just 1. Okay? So there is a really overall minus sign on this side. So this means that m squared mu nu is given by minus of what I have written here. Yeah, there is overall minus here, so that minus sign will cancel this minus sign. Okay, over here. Delta v will go away. So what else will happen? Well, there are a lot of minus signs. There is i, I g squared also. So, <coughs> Overall, let's see. So half and two goes. There is a half delta IB, so we get half. So minus half g square. So there is another minus. There is another minus. No, there is I inside the face. No, but oh, there is four. But there is also m, so you have to keep it as it is. Okay, okay we'll do that to minus. That will also give minus, but that will be done later. Okay. Right now, the ones which are outside, we just cancel. So. The, 1 minus, right? Because this side is plus, there is 1 minus. Half factors are okay. There is only this half. Delta M is cancelled, so we get sum over N. So now I am going to drop the P. So, I gamma tilde rho k rho plus m inverse gamma tilde mu I gamma tilde sigma k sigma plus m inverse gamma tilde mu. So you have to calculate the inverses of this, okay, which are in fact using this relation that gamma tilde mu, gamma tilde mu is 2 delta mu mu. Okay, we can easily calculate the inverses. So I gamma tilde rho k rho plus m inverse is basically minus I gamma tilde rho k rho the same over k square the same square. Okay, this I think you are all familiar with from the drag. Right? The inverse is given by this. So both of these I can now replace by this. So let's just calculate the trace part, okay? Because that's the complicated part. So you have a trace, so you have a one over k squared plus m squared whole squared and then inside the trace we have minus i gamma tilde rho k rho plus m gamma tilde mu minus i gamma tilde sigma k sigma plus m gamma tilde So, if we expand out the product, 
there will be four terms. But two of them have odd number of gamma matrices. Okay, and the trace over odd number of gamma matrices vanish. Okay, so two of them will vanish. So the ones which will survive from here is m square gamma tilde mu gamma tilde mu minus okay and that's that uh, extra minus sign gamma tilde rho a rho gamma tilde mu gamma tilde sigma a sigma gamma tilde mu gamma tilde sigma a sigma The next trick is to take this and anti commuter. So, this product I can write as minus gamma tilde mu times gamma tilde rho k rho plus 2 k rho using this. Right, I just anti commuted them. So, I this is first term is the opposite order, and then this is anti commuted. So, let us expand this out one more once more m square gamma tilde mu gamma tilde mu that is one term. Second term, you see that this first of all the minus and minus becomes plus. So, plus. Here gamma tilde rho k rho sits next to gamma tilde sigma k sigma. So this product has becomes k square. So plus k square times gamma tilde mu gamma tilde mu. And minus 2 k mu. And then trace of gamma tilde sigma, okay, k mu k sigma, trace of gamma tilde sigma, gamma tilde mu. All at trace, yes, thank you. So, all at trace, so let me write this from. So now I'll use trace gamma tilde mu gamma tilde mu, and as we had discussed in the earlier course, that when you make an analytic the dimension and continuation, the dimension of the gamma tilde matrix is a spinner dimension. We keep fixed at four. Okay, that's one choice. You have other choices. So if you use that convention, the trace of gamma tilde mu gamma tilde mu is basically four delta mu. Okay, trace of gamma tilde mu gamma tilde mu. mu is 4 delta mu nu. Using that we can write this, this object as 4 k square plus m square delta mu nu. Minus Eight. Okay, okay. Is this okay? Okay, so with this, I am not going to write down the expression for m square. So m square mu nu from this. Minus half g square t sum over n 
integral d d k over 2 pi to d So, this object I have calculated. There is a 1 over k square plus m square whole square. Okay. So, inside I get 4 over k square plus m square 4 delta mu nu minus 8 k mu k mu over k square plus m square whole square. Now, this integral in general is complicated, okay. so we will simplify life by now taking the high temperature limit okay. or the zero mass limit. Okay. The result will depend on the ratio m over t, right. that is the, that's the only dimensionless parameter. Okay. So, let us try to evaluate this for m equal to 0, right, which means that we are not setting the formula mass also to 0. Okay. So, evaluate for m equal to 0. m equal to 0 which basically corresponds to t large. And we can see that we have to evaluate this separately for 0, 0 and i j. The 0 i components vanish. Is that obvious? 0 i component, yeah. Because of the, the odd function. Yeah, so the first term of course vanishes, delta 0 i is 0. Here you have k 0 ki, right? ki is an odd function, so when you do the k integral it vanishes. Okay. So, 0 0 component and i j component is what you have to evaluate. Okay, and we will do it separately. So, m square i j is given by minus half g square t sum over n integral d d k over 2 pi to d 4 delta i j over k square minus 8 k i k j delta i j by d delta i j by d k square is that k i k j again by uh, this symmetry right it will vanish unless i is equal to j okay. and it does not depend on the value of i right if i is equal to j it is the same it takes the same value right so you can take the average sum over all possible i's and divide by d okay. so this is given by minus 8 a square 8 over d k square delta i j over k square k square, what k square, is this clear, k 8 is 8, right. all I am saying is that k i k j integral is just 1 over d times k square times delta i j. Okay, so now let us 
to this system. So integral d d k over 2 pi to d t 1 over k square is k square plus omega m square this can evaluate in dimensional regularization right? we have given the formula explicitly but let's just look at its dependence on omega okay, it's some constant okay you can in fact check that it's finite constant okay in the d goes to 3 limit so there's no divergence here omega n to which power square omega n just from scaling of k you can fix that power yeah. so omega n square why you want omega n square Maybe this k squared the whole time integration right? No, oh, d d k. Sorry, d d. I, I yeah. think about four dimensions. No, d d minus two. D minus two. Omega n to the power d minus two. Yes, omega n to the power d minus two. Is clear? Now, integral d d k. Over 2 pi to the d, 1 over k square plus omega n square whole square. So, what is it? Yes? Omega to the d minus 4. Here actually 2 terms. Some constant as omega to the d minus 4. That everybody agrees? But I am not satisfied with that answer. I need the constant. Yeah. <laughs> I need the constant in terms of A. Yeah, this is No, you don't have to do any Feynman parameter. See, if you take the derivative of this with respect to omega n, right? You bring down omega n square, right? So this, let me write as 1 over omega n del del omega n 1 over minus 1 over 2 omega n. I think this is the correct thing, right? Because if you take del del omega n, you first of all get a minus sign, right? And again, we get a 2 omega n in the numerator. So, 1 minus 1 over 2 omega n del del omega n of that object, a omega n to the power d minus 2. Okay? So, this gives you minus half times or minus d minus 2 by 2 a omega n to the power d minus 4. Is this clear? Okay, now let's manipulate this a little bit. Yeah. K square is K square plus omega n square, right? This is K square plus omega n square. So I don't want too many integrals, I want to write everything in terms of these two. Okay. That's not hard because this K square that appears here, I can write as K square plus omega n square minus omega n square. Right? So I can write this as k square plus omega n square minus omega n square. Okay? So if we do that, let me write a step here minus half g square t sum over n integral d d k over 2 pi to the power t we get delta ij I can take out minus delta ij here. So, you get 4, so 1 over k square or k square plus omega n square, let me write 1 over k square plus omega n square. What is the coefficient of this? So, there is a 4 here. 
minus 8 by d because this then a k square plus omega n square over k square plus omega n square whole square so minus 8 by d. And then there is a plus omega n square so plus omega n square that comes with the coefficient of 8 by d again right plus 8 by d omega n square over k square plus omega n square whole square. <coughs> So let's calculate m square ij. So this is minus delta ij by 2 g square t sum over n. And now I am going to write the result of this integral. So first we get 4 minus 8 by d. times integral d dk over 2 by 2 dt over this, that's this one, a omega n to the power t minus 2. Then you have plus 8 over t, 8 over t, omega n square, and then minus d minus 2 by 2 a omega n 2 by d minus 2 d minus 4 so what is the result of this Both are a omega n to d minus 2, right? Because, but what is the coefficient? <coughs> 4 minus 8 over d. minus 4 over d times d minus 2, right? So it's 0. <laughs> okay? So we see that EIs don't get any mass. Temperature limit basically the peak makes the non abelian mysteries. Basically, in the high temperature limit, AI is effectively behave as a three dimensional gauge theory, right? Because basically, okay, this, this we'll discuss next time, maybe in more detail. The high temperature limit, right, as um, we discussed last time, is like compactifying the time direction, right? So, effectively. It becomes a three dimensional theory. Starting from four dimensional theory, all the modes go away, right? Become very massive, except the zero modes. Okay? So it becomes a three dimensional theory, and that three dimensional theory actually has the full three dimensional gauge invariance. Okay? Because if ij, okay, symmetry is not broken, right? So by gauge invariance, so now the same reason why the gauge fields don't acquire mass in at uh, zero temperature in four dimension, right? You apply the same reasoning to argue that these gauge fields cannot acquire a mass because these are three dimensional gauge fields okay, with regular gauge symmetry. Okay, so they cannot acquire, acquire any mass term. Okay, but here you see by explicit calculation that indeed the AIJ, the AIs don't have any mass. Okay, and this we have done for formulaic proofs, but you can explicitly calculate the gauge field and it goes to and the same result will follow. Okay, that there will not be any mass term for the formula. For the yeah, one could keep the m square, right? The calculation will be more important, right? You can try to see what happens when you keep the m square. Is that 
square plus n square will be called. Yeah, so it will be like omega. You have to take omega n square plus m square and then see what you get. Temperature is uh, like the scale of the. Yeah, the, the size of a compact reaction is like the inverse temperature, the beta, right? So if the beta goes to zero limit, right, which is the high temperature limit, right, you are basically making this time direction very small, right? So it's hard to excite anything. Anything that carries momentum in those directions are very heavy. Right? So you can imagine that you can just integrate them out. You can write an effective theory in low dimension. So that the degrees of freedom of that effective theory <laughs> will be only the zero modes, only the modes that carry zero momentum in the uh, time direction. Yeah, the gap is very high. The gap is very high. Okay? And keeping the zero modes basically means that you are projecting into a gauge theory in three dimensions. Okay, but let's now calculate the other one, m square 0, 0, right? That, that we have not shown is 0. So let's see what happens to that. See, m square ij should be 0 in all order in perturbation theory. Yes, m square ij because by this gauge invariance yeah. argument should be 0. So you see here, it will be 8 omega n square, right, over k e square plus m square whole square. But we have seen that from this identity, okay, let me maybe write down one more thing, minus half g square p sum over n over 3 pi to the d 4 over k square minus 8 omega n square over k square whole square. Now we are basically going to use the fact that using this omega n square for k with k square whole square okay, from this analysis we have seen that it is nothing but minus d minus 2 over 2 times the first integral. So this I can re replace by minus d minus 2 by 2 times omega n square was already gone. So by minus 8 times d minus 2 by 2 times 1 over k is square. Inside the integral they gave the same result. Is that clear? Because this is 1 over k is square whole square, right? And here are the relations. So I, unfortunately I erased part of it, but you can already see this. This was 1 over k is square for omega n square, it was 1 over k is square for omega n square whole square. Okay. The second integral is minus d minus 2 by 2 times the first integral, right? Second integral after multiplied by omega n square is just minus d by minus 2 by 2 times the first integral. So that is what I am writing here. So then we get minus half g square. Okay. Now let me write as 4 minus 4 times d minus 2 plus because minus and minus plus 4 times d minus 2 times 
this function sigma f of t And let's also define sigma b of t as t times some n belonging to z integral t d k multiplied by t common k square. Okay, this b stands for bosonic modding. Okay, n is integer. Here n is half. Integral we had actually evaluated before. Okay, if you look at your notes near the beginning of the lecture, said in the context of uh, describing free scalars, right? When you are calculating partition function of free scalars, right? We had encountered integral like this before, and let me write down the result for this. Okay, the evaluation is straightforward, right? You basically first do this integral using dimensional regularization, then you sum over n by contour integral. Okay, that's how you had evaluated this. Result and this was found to be t square by 12. Okay, so now we have to calculate sigma f of t. So, what is sigma f in terms of sigma b? There is a general identity we have derived. Do sigma b of t by 2 minus sigma b of t. This was the formula. So this will be 2 times 1 over 12 times t square over 4 minus t square over 12. So this gives you minus t square over 24. Because this is t square over 24 minus t square over 12. So minus t square over 24. So now we are done, right? We just have to substitute it here. So m square 0, 0. Is minus half g square times well, let's now substitute d equal to 3. So, 4 plus 4 times minus t square over 24. This is 4 d equal to 3. So, that's t square t square over 6, right? Let me just finish by writing on a general formula. Okay, before I write a general formula, let me just mention that if you are doing QED with fermions, right, with uh, I mean, say electron, then also this formula is valid. 
the only place where we have to make a correction is that we had used trace TATV is equal to half delta IV, right? In QBD, the natural normalization is that it's just one, T is just one, right? You just couple it with G. So that half will not be there. So it will be G square T square by 3. Okay, where G is the electric, uh, basically standard what you call it, like the charge of the electron. So the general result in ACU and C, this theory, with NF formions in fundamental the result for m square 0 0 is g square g square times nc by 3 plus nn by 6. Okay, this nf by 6 of course you easily understand, right? You just multiply this by nf, with the nf of this formula. This is non-trivial, this comes basically by calculating the gauge, gauge and the post -tools. Okay, But the analysis is um, very similar, it's more tedious. Okay, because the Feynman rules are a little more complicated, but the calculation is uh, similar. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. Any questions? So then in high temperature, the, this extra mode is difficult. Yeah, if you are at very high, very high temperature, yes. Okay, but the point is that. The, because the mass is like g square t square, right? In high temperature, every mode will have mass. Most modes will have far far on mass, right? Except the AIs, okay, which are protected by gauge invariance. So if you want to decouple these modes, right? Then every other mode also decouples, right? So you can write down an effective theory of only the AIs. So the gluons get massive. <coughs> yeah, the gluons are the I the, the spatial modes don't get massive. Special components, but the zero components get mass. Right? It's the same calculation. Right? We did the calculation for the glow also, right? Okay.